that does help when I am helping others. So as I've moved and moved around and lived in different places, I've also been on the job search many times on my own and made different transitions. So I want you to think about a road trip. Imagine you're going 3000 miles. I know a lot of us feel cooped up at home and haven't had a chance to do that as much as we want to lately, but think about that road trip. And what do you need before you go on the road trip? Tell me in the chat, like what's the first thing you're gonna make sure you have? Give me some of your thoughts. Any thoughts on the road trip? What's the first thing you want? I know for me, I'm gonna share my thought is I want to make sure back in the old days, aging myself, I always wanted a map. But now most of us all want to make sure that we have our destination and our GPS. And when we think about that, anytime we make a big change, we take a big trip, it's all about like we want to make sure we know that destination. Now we might have pit stops and we might take some U-turns and, and curve around a little bit and that road could be whiny, windy. And, but we, we ultimately always have that destination in mind and we have that GPS that tells us how we're going to get there. Life isn't always so easy that GPS doesn't always uh, give us that exact path. But when we're looking for a job, starting with the destination and really having that end in mind is really important. And I work with a lot of people who I find sometimes have like this big wide open book and they start taking Udacity courses and wanting to get into maybe a certain area of tech and really haven't started to think about what, what the destination is, what job they're really aiming for. And again, it can change, it can evolve, but having a target, having a goal can really help you set yourself up for success. And I like this quote to help think about it from Stephen Covey. If many of you have probably read The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, but to begin with the end in mind means to start with a clear understanding of your destination. And remember, that's an understanding of your destination. That means, again, it's flexible. It means that to know where you're going so that you better understand where you are now and that you take the steps in, that you're always taking steps in the right direction to get to that end goal. And thinking about that as you embark on the job search, as you're thinking about the job search, you know, and, and we're going to talk a lot about these target jobs, but you know, put it up on your bullet board, write it down, have it on your computer, remind yourself like this is what I'm aiming for. So that the days when you're maybe going through some of these programming classes, you're sitting and listening webinars, you're out trying to network, think always about what that end is in mind. What is it that you're really aiming for? So today we are going to talk a lot about keeping that beginning with the end in mind. We're going to help you with some tips to get off to an efficient job search. We're going to look at your app, application materials checklist, making sure you, you know what you need and some resources to ha help you get all of those things in order. And we're going to have plenty of time for questions. So again, here we go again. Begin with the end in mind. Know the job you're targeting. That is the destination. And a lot of people say, well, I don't, do I have to have the ultimate dream job? What, you know, how much are you telling me I have to have here, right? Remember, this can be a stepping stone. It doesn't mean it's the ultimate dream job where you see yourself, you know, finishing off your career someday in the long future. It could be the next stop. But the, the point is that you know what you're trying to get right now. And if you have a goal of where you want to be in five, 10 years, 15 years, that's awesome. But don't feel like you have to have that just to get started on this next role because it can be flexible and targets can move. And we're going to talk a lot about having a starting at your job search sometimes with a really small focus. Think about that bullseye in the middle of that um, dartboard. And if you start your job search in this really small target and you say, this is, this is my five dream companies. This is what I really want. That's, awesome and fantastic to focus your efforts there. Then gradually, as, as maybe you exhaust that resource or you put out all your feelers, you put out as many applications as you can in that small focus, then you can start to let the search field grow a little and maybe look at 
um, some second choice companies or some related companies or maybe some new companies that you've thought of or came across that sound interesting to you. So when you begin with the end in mind, first thing I recommend is research job descriptions. I talk to so many people who think they have an idea of what they want to do. They start taking classes, they're aiming for something, but they haven't really looked at the meat of the job descriptions yet. If you know you want to be a product manager, start with, you know, big companies typically have very uh, elaborate job descriptions. So sometimes those are the best to look at to get an idea of what all it could encompass. Now, I will warn you, they also like to put a lot of information in their job descriptions that sometimes it's overkill in terms of what you might be looking for. So as you research the job, the job descriptions, start getting a feel for what's out there. If I'm looking for a product manager role, I'm going to look maybe at what does a Google product manager look like? What is a, a startup product manager over here? Maybe a consumer good product. And then I'm going to start to feel like I have some of these ideal next jobs. I can start seeing where I know that I fit in. I'm going to look at where I know my strengths are. Maybe it's new skills I've built or something I've done in the past that aligns really well with that job. Then I'm also going to look at maybe where I have gaps and we don't want to ignore that, right? If we're looking down the job description and feeling really good and go, well, I'll just ignore those couple points that they're asking for. You don't want to do that. You want to make sure you're really looking, where am I aligned and where do I have gaps? And obviously those areas where you're aligned and you have those strengths, pointing those out in your resume, putting that in your LinkedIn, making sure that's visible. Where you have gaps, that's where you want to either maybe some quick things that you can upskill, a project you can do, something you need to practice. Maybe it's something in a new programming language that you need to get a little more practice with to feel a little more confident. Then you start to look at those ideal jobs. Then we're going to start and then in step three there, we're going to talk about prioritizing and analyzing the key job factors. And those are the keys to you. It's not the same for everyone. There's times in our life where maybe the factor that's most important is location. Maybe it's work-life balance. Maybe it's money. It can be very different for different people at different times in our lives, different stages of our lives. So as you start researching job descriptions, look, I want you to really look beyond the title. You might start with title. So if you know you want to be a you want to be in a data analyst. So that's obviously going to be where you start. But if you're not feeling like you're really getting the exact job that you want, maybe you start thinking about going beyond the title, even, even adjusting the title slightly, junior data analyst, senior data analyst, um, associate data analyst, and then expand a little bit on the title, see what's out there, then start looking at different searches and different keywords. So I might say, okay, I know I'm really good in SQL. I know that I love working with different databases. I'm gonna just type, put those keywords in, in different areas, maybe on LinkedIn, maybe I'm gonna look at Indeed, so that I'm getting different job titles coming up and I can start expanding this target area that I'm looking at. The next thing is the quick scan, and I can't emphasize this enough. I find that a lot of people will look at a job description and they will think about it and they will debate it and they will wonder if they're a good fit for days or weeks before they apply. So in terms of leading an efficient job search, there's a couple little tricks that I wanna share that can help you with that quick scan. I want you to ask yourself, you're gonna read that job description really quickly. And after that quick scan, ask yourself, am I confident I can do the job? Big picture, do I feel like I can do that job? Next, do I meet about 75% of the requirements? Remember when I said that companies like to put a lot of uh, con uh, content in those descriptions? Most jobs, they would not expect you to be able to do 100% of what they're asking for. And I'll get back to that later. Third question is, do I think I would like the job? And if you answer yes, pretty quickly to all three of these. I want you to either, if you don't have time to apply that minute, if you're in, let's say LinkedIn or Indeed, you can save that, put a heart on it, like it, whatever you need to do in that platform and save it to apply for later. That goes in the yes pile. 
if if obviously if you if you say no to most of those you're going to kick it out and delete it you're going to ignore it if you're not quite sure and it's a maybe then maybe you want to read it a little bit closer see how you're feeling if you're not sure maybe put it in, put it back in that yes pile for a while and come back to it later so the point is just as quick as recruiters are going to be filtering through resumes that's how quick i want you filtering through job descriptions i want you to look i want you to ask yourself those three questions make a really quick decision if you have time apply right then don't overanalyze. do i think they'll like me do i th don't try to predict and project what they're thinking on their end think about what you believe and what you know and what you want because that's all you're in control of so by taking the approach of it's up to you to decide am i confident i can do the job do i meet 75 percent of the requirements and do i think i would like it then apply you can you know if you get the call back if you if they send you an email you can go way deeper and you will go way deeper in that job description before ever getting into the interview process and probably after, as you're applying and maybe preparing a cover letter maybe tweaking your resume if you need to a little bit for that application you might then be going a little deeper anyway, but don't let maybe one bullet point scare you away from applying or make you think about and analyze that for, for weeks on end and, and lose the opportunity or just be really inefficient with your time. And that 75% that of the requirements, again, there's a few reasons why there's a lot of content in job descriptions. One is because the position could grow and they, they don't want to, they want to hedge their bets and they want to make sure someone's saying, you know, I'm willing to take on more work. I'm, I'm willing and able to, to get into this space, even if some of that's growing into the space. Also at times they have three or four managers who are maybe hiring a data analyst. And, you know, I'm saying I want this Garfield saying he wants that uh, Leonardo saying he wants that. So, I take all of that as the HR manager and I, I put it all in there so that I'm covered, right? Because I'm not going to put in six different job descriptions. So quick scan, make the decision, apply for the job. Let them decide later if, if they think you're a good match, right? You don't need to stress about what, what they might be thinking about you. And let me just, I'm gonna stop sharing here for a second and just see if there are any questions. Um, it looks like a couple have popped up and, and my, my chat for some reason is not wanting to pop out for me. So I'm going to just look here and see what questions have come up. Uh, what about the cases where I don't know if I would like the job because it's a new area? Even if I had the theoretical or academic experience, we know that in practice, it could be different. Leonardo, that's a good question. And I think that, you know, in those cases, if you're not sure you're really going to like it, but you, you know, you're qualified and you know, you'd be a good fit, probably go ahead and apply. You can look deeper later. Now, if you've applied and you start doing a little more research, you get called for an interview and you're really not sure. Like if you've decided, if you've decided I don't want that job, then you don't want to waste their time either. And you might politely decline and say that, you know, that you don't want to waste their time with the interview. You've moved on to something else. If you're still not sure, it's okay to have that first interview and have some conversations and learn more about the job. The interview process really should be a two way street. It should be just as much as you want to know about that company. They want to know about you, right? So I think we all go into interviews thinking, oh, it's all about them assessing me. But you should be assessing the company so much at the same time. And that's where when we really kind of flip that thinking and, and going into interviews, we come up with better questions in the end. We have better conversations as opposed to feeling like I'm up, you know, on the stand of the courtroom being drilled. That's not the way it should be. It should really be a conversation where you're learning more. Uh, let's see the next question. Um, how do you find a job when your Nana degree is not a recognized standard and you don't have re any recognized certifications? So what I have found with the Nana degrees is, is first in tech in general, a lot of people know about Udacity. And the more people that are taking classes, our alumni base is growing, it's getting stronger and stronger. 
But what really sets you apart is not so much that certificate, but it's your projects. It's the projects you've completed. And that's really where Udacity makes a big difference is the quality of the projects, the robust and complex nature of the products, projects. So it's important to show those projects on your resume, to show them on LinkedIn, so that then when you get to the interview, you can talk through those projects and give them the confidence that you have, that, that, that they, you want them to have in you. And thank you earlier for the, the messages on what you wanted on your road trip. We've got gas planning, milestone, food, and a map. I love it. So thank you. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Another question. I think I just covered that one and another one popped up. What's the best way to say no if we don't know the answer to an interview question? That is a good point. I think the, I'm going to give you a couple strategies on this and it could be a whole session on talking about interviewing. But first, before you go into any interview, I want you to think of your top five to 10 stories that you have. They could be stories describing projects you've done. They could be stories describing a team you've worked on, a challenge you've had. Stories that can really show a bigger picture of you, can show how, you're, how you have performed in the workplace, how you've managed a team, how you have completed a big project. And when you have those stories ready before you go into an interview, it's a lot easier to be able to field all kinds of different questions. Now, if they say to you, you know, Angela, can you program in Python? And I've never uh, written code in my life. I, I have to say no, right? There's nothing around that. Um, and clearly I shouldn't be in the interview if that question is that far out of left field. So hopefully you're, the, the questions they're asking you aren't, you should be already in the interview, a pretty decent match for what they're looking for. So if it's something you're not as familiar with, or if it's something new you've been working on, it's okay to say, you know, that is an area where I've been, you know, skilling up, I've, I've completed some projects, I've taken a course, or, you know, maybe uh, because I've done a lot in R, I know that uh, Python, and this is where you all you uh, Python experts can laugh at me and my knowledge starts to get a little rusty, but Maybe I could say that something I've done that's similar that I've, and I've started to look at that code and I'm getting more familiar and I feel comfortable learning it and picking it up a little quicker. So anything that you can say that kind of has a, a, a little bit of a parallel that you can describe is a good way to, to bring up a different story and show your other strengths. Let's see. Going through a couple more questions. How much detail on the projects? This is a good question. How much detail on the projects should you include on your resume and job profile? So if, if you are, let's say you're a very experienced data analyst and you've got a lot of data analytics work experience, and then you've taken the data science nano degree to upskill in different areas, then your project section probably doesn't need to be as elaborate because you have all that work experience behind you. So your project section is complementary, just adds a little bit more. Now, if you have taken the data science nano degree, but you have never worked in data, it's all new to you. Those projects are super, super, super important. So if I've only ever worked, let's say as a financial analyst, and now I've picked up these data courses. I want that project section to be a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger, maybe even a little more prominent. I'm going to put it at the top of my resume as opposed to maybe under my work experience. So it's really when you think like, what, what's the gap? What's the reason for your projects? Is it to show like, this is all I've done in this space and I need you to see it? Or I've been doing a little bit of all of this and the project is like a bonus on mine. Then that can help you gauge how much you should have it. Now it should not be, in any case, it should not be super technical. It needs to just, you know, I, I recommend naming the project. So let's say you've done the bike sharing app project. And so you're gonna name that bike sharing app project. Then oftentimes people put Udacity maybe in parentheses or, or underneath it and give one sentence to describe that project. So you might say, you know, and, and always say the, 
like the, what you learned or the outcome of it and the technology you used. Having that technology in there is really important. If it was something you did in C++, C++ needs to be in there because that's what it gives you that keyword on your resume. And it also describes the technical nature of what you did. Let's see. How do you know it's the right time to start applying if you already have a job? Maybe you've developed an interest in a field and start learning about it, but don't know when to start applying as well. You know, I think the first thing I would do before jumping into a new space is think about networking in that space, talking to other people who work in the area where you really like to be. And by doing that, you'll start to get a better sense of if you're ready, is it a good time to switch? And instead of maybe taking the first step as being actively applying, the first step is actively networking, actively connecting and, and get a sense if you're ready for that. I will come back. I see more questions. This is awesome. I love that there's so many of you popping questions in there. I am going to pop back to the slides for a little bit and then we will come back to your questions. So thinking about the different factors in the job. So let's say now you're at the point you've done the quick scan, you've, you've decided to apply and, and maybe you're it's something to kind of do a, in tandem. So you're thinking about like, what is that dream job? What, is, what am I really targeting? What's important to me? What is ideal? And then what's acceptable, right? Because we all have like the ideal compensation that we want, but then we also have kind of like this acceptable range as well. So these are some of the areas that you want to think about what's most important to you, what's ideal, what's acceptable. It's also good, uh, I often recommend giving yourself a, like a ranking scale. Maybe you put these in the order that's most important to you. Maybe you give it a, a one to five rating and, and really analyze this to think, is it most important? Some people, and title's really important. They're really trying to move up in their organization or over to another organization and title's gonna have a high priority. Some people moving into a new space, they really don't care about the title as long as the function of the job is right. So think about what's most important to you. Is it the skills? Is it the skills you can build and grow in? Is it the industry you're in? Is it the type of organization? Do you wanna be in a, a large, more established organization? Do you wanna be in a startup? Do you want to be in an organization? Is the culture important to you? And, and obviously all of these things to some extent are important to all of us, but it's important going into, as you target jobs, as you start interviewing, really knowing your priority priorities so that you feel more confident in as you do those quick scans what it is you're looking for what what it is that and, and obviously you're not going to maybe know all of these exact factors and all the details before interviewing but it can at least get you thinking this way and you have in your mind this is what's most important to me So a few things to think about in the in this different uh, these different categories. The first is your title, right? Some people you is it too senior? Is it is it are you worried you won't be able to do the job? Is it too junior and you feel like it's a step down, or is it a lateral move and that's not really what you're looking for? Um, function is it exact what you've done? Is it similar? Is it too advanced? Similar to title. Skills are the skills that they like and want you to use, what you've been building, what you've been growing and what you want to do. Is it the industry, is it something I like, something I know, something I believe in? Uh, the organization, and, and when I think, when I say something I believe in, you know, I worked with someone recently who was working in an industry that she really had struggled with the values of the industry. And so she, she did struggle staying there and was really looking to get out and said she probably all along should have maybe not been in that industry. Uh, again, organization, is it a startup? Is it a large corporate? Is it a big tech company? Do they give a good work-life balance? What's the culture? The location, uh, obviously we all know remote's happening a lot these days. Is your location the most important? That helps you narrow down that search pretty quick, right? Some people say, oh, it's just tough because I, I can only work in, in Nashville or you know, in, in Paris, wherever you are. 
that's actually sometimes, you know, when people say, I can go anywhere, I'll, you know, live, work anywhere, I'll do whatever. Sometimes that's a lot harder to get your hands on the search and grasp it because the playing field's so big. So even if you are thinking of a, a country that, or a, you know, several cities, try to, try to narrow it as much as you feel comfortable at first so that you can get some momentum in your search and, and have strategies and goals for kind of digging into those spaces. Compensation, you may not know exactly, but you can research. Glassdoor is a great place, talking to people in the industry and kind of estimating that potential, but really knowing, knowing personally what, where you want to be compensated, what you think is fair, what you think it would be an awesome, maybe stretch compensation, and, and really that, that space where you're most comfortable. So as you look through these jobs and you've, you're, you're looking at that end destination, right? You might find the exact job description that's exactly what you want. You might find about five or six job descriptions that you like pieces of all of them. Sit down and create that ideal next job. Put it in writing. See what it looks like. Help yourself really visualize where you're headed. And, you know, if, if we had a magic wand and you end up finding that exact job, then let's all celebrate. Chances are it's not going to be exactly what you create, but it really does help you. You've prioritized, you know what you want to do, you've set this goal and it makes it way easier searching for a job when you've got maybe two or three job titles, uh, a, a certain industry or two that you're looking at. You can really go deeper and start networking and digging into those companies and making connections and making interviews happen rather than having this wide open book. So again, that ideal next job is going to give you, set your vision, it's going to help you focus, and it's going to help you have a targeted search. And you're going to feel a lot more efficient, like you're making progress and getting momentum, which is really important, as we all know, when, you, when you're out of work and you start feeling that stress and you don't feel progress and you don't feel momentum, by not having these, having the vision, having the focus, having the end goal, it makes it really hard to have an effective search. But remember, targets can change. Allow yourself to be flexible. It's, I know, in, in one hand, I'm saying, like, have this tight focus and stay here. And, and, but that's to help you get started. It can grow. It can change. It can evolve. And that's okay. So how do you get there? How do you get to that next job? And how do you make sure that you've got everything in place to, to get those interviews? When you navigate the job search, you want to make sure your application materials are ready. That's one of the first thing. Obviously, your resume, your LinkedIn, we're going to talk about how Udacity can help you with that. And really making sure you're setting daily goals. Every day, if, if you're, maybe, maybe some of you are still working, maybe some of you are working on Udacity and not working full time right now, but set those goals. How much time can you commit each day? And, and have it not just be, the search shouldn't be just applying for jobs. It should include networking, it should include a little research, include every, every time, you know, every third job you apply for even, look at your resume again. Well, look at it every time before you attach it and send it, but spend it, you know, every few jobs, sit down and really think about it. Is there something I can do to make it even better? Udacity resources we'll talk about. Um, again, as I mentioned with the application materials, we have reviews of your LinkedIn, your resume, um, and cover letter for all Udacity students. That's all included in your nano degree. Your resume doesn't have to be perfect for you to go through that. It's not meant to be. So do the project. You get lots of tips and advice. You'll make some edits and then you submit it for feedback. It's not going to anyone else. Don't worry. It's not getting posted anywhere. It's just for that reviewer to help give you feedback. You can also get uh, additional support in your one-to-one -one coaching sessions on all of those. Separately, we also have a GitHub review that's relevant to only to certain nano degrees. Obviously not every person has a GitHub. So if that's relevant to you, you can also get that reviewed. I will say that 
the career coaches are not <laughs> usually the person to ask about GitHub. That needs to be one of our technical reviewers for that. Some of you might need a portfolio. So if you are a content creator, if you are doing UX design, those often require a portfolio. That is something that we can give you resources to help make sure you're getting that right. You can talk about those in one-to-one -one coaching, depending on how technical it, um, we can share what we've seen from other people. I know I've seen several portfolios in different areas and, and I can help give guidance on this is what else I've seen. Maybe this could make it better. And that's how you, and, and, and peer feedback is a great thing with portfolios. Asking a friend or ex-colleague, classmate that you might've had in the past to look at your portfolio. So what can be some of your next steps? I recommend, com that should not say compete your Udacity career projects, they should say complete. And so make sure you're doing those career projects, book a one-to-one -one coaching session. Some people like to do the projects and then go into their coaching sessions. Some people vice versa. Whatever you do, don't wait till the end of your nano degree to get started. If you know your goal is to get a job, get started with your coaching services with the career projects as soon as possible. Uh, work on one at a time, have a meeting with a coach and get through some of this so that when you're done with the nano degree or if you have a, if you're, if you're waiting for maybe a certain time to start looking for a job based on something in your personal life or a move or your old job, then you want to start getting everything in place so that you get that momentum going. That is the end of the content that I have. I see a lot of questions up, so I'm going to stop sharing so I can make my screen bigger and get to the questions. Also, if you have a question you would like to unmute and ask, you can also type in and let me know that. We do have a big group, so I'd rather there'll be better if everyone stays muted because we'll get a lot of background noise if we undo everybody. If you want to ask a question, go ahead and type it in. Uh, do we have a limit on the number of coaching sessions? Yes, there is a limit. They're all a little bit different, but generally speaking, you get about one per month that you're enrolled and then you have up to a year to use those. And I will say that you know, some of you that have booked, you know that there can be a bit of a wait to get availability in a coach's calendar. So again, it's a, another reason to make sure you're uh, booking well in advance. Uh, let's see, more questions. What things should we avoid while writing a cover letter? The biggest thing to, two things I'd say to avoid when writing a cover letter is one, to make it way too generic, saying I have good leadership skills, strong communication, right? Like you need to give them, give them a story, give them some information and, and don't just regurgitate your resume. It's not about saying I went to school here and I worked here and I did this. Give them one or two stories. Think about what couple things do you want them to know that's not so obvious in your resume? Or maybe it's a point that's obvious, but you can give a little more detail. Give a little more of a story there. Let's see. Uh, someone asked if they get, if you're in more than one nano degree, do I get more than one session per month? I don't think so. I think they've just recently clarified with us to, that it would be one per month, regardless of how many nano degrees you're in. But I could, it's a little confusing and I would recommend, and I'll type in the chat here, the career support email that you can send, they can let you know specifically to you how many coaching sessions you have and when you get them. Someone asked, how many pages should a resume be for a freshers? I, one page for sure. If you are less than 10 years of work experience, one page is where you should be. In Europe and Asia, that can be a little bit different. Sometimes they like a little more detail and you could probably go to two pages. The big tech companies will all, are typically require one page only at any level. So I recommend in, in any case, have a one page resume. Have, get it concise, get those key points, 
And then you could have a longer version with more detail that you know you because you want all that content and maybe you want to pull some things in and out for different different job applications. I recommend not trying to have six different versions of your resume. If you could have one strong version that then maybe you slightly tweak for different applications, that's okay. Um, people that try to completely reinvent their resume and have four different resumes for it, it, it ends up being really inefficient and it's hard to get again that momentum and get progress going and getting a lot of applications. I will turn off the recording now. So we will keep asking questions that way. If you want to unmute and ask a question, you can. For those of you watching this recorded, thanks for joining. We'll stop.